Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. My name is Sevon and today I'm going to be doing a long-term review of my 2005 John Cooper Works Edition Mini Cooper S. I've owned this car for the better part of two years now and I'm going to go through the driving dynamics, the things I've done to the car, the modifications, the maintenance, the things I've encountered, the things I've had to fix, and overall the ownership experience of owning a car like this. So stick around for the ride. This is my first car review so any feedback is welcome, just let me know how the audio is, how the video is. It's been finicky setting up all these cameras and I've had a few memory cards uh, corrupt on me so far during this experience, so hopefully everything stays intact while I do this review. Alright, so let's turn on the car and go for a drive. First thing you guys might notice is that the exhaust is not stock. The John Cooper Works tuning package already comes with an upgraded exhaust, but I've swapped that out for an NVIDIA N1. And what that's that the only reason for that is really just the noise. I wanted something a little louder than what the John Cooper Works is giving me. And if you guys, hopefully the audio picks it up. But on off throttle, there's some nice loud pops and burbles, and that really catches people's attention and brings a big smile to my face. Now the other thing I love about this car is that the supercharger wine just gives the car a lot more character. This car is all about character. It's not about things making sense. A two-door front-wheel drive hatch is a pretty common thing in Europe. But when you're talking about American roads where we've got a lot of straights, um, you know, the Mini Cooper has an argument to make. So let's start off with the modifications that I've done to the car. I've already mentioned the John Cooper X exhaust being swapped out for the NVIDIA N1. The approach I take with a lot of the cars that I modify is I always handle the chassis and suspension first. I like having a better balanced car and don't necessarily care too much about power. I've swapped out the original suspension for Coney Sport Yellows paired with Swift Spec R Springs. I put a beefier rear sway bar on the car, so it kind of neutralized the handling. Whereas there might have been a tight, a small amount of understeer before, this car does not understeer at all. In fact, if I push the car too hard into a corner, if I'm going in too hot, it might actually swing out the rear end, which I've done a few times on the racetrack. Yeah, you, you really can't drive this car without having a massive grin on your face. We've got a nice sweeper. So where this car really shines is the handling. A lot of people will say that it handles like a go-kart. And at this point it might sound like a cliche, but it really does. And especially with the modifications I've done to the chassis, or the suspension rather. I've also swapped out the original brakes that were on the car with a Willwood brake kit. So that upgraded the rotor size to 11.75 inch. And you got a much beefier caliper in there too to handle the heat dissipation. So I've done multiple 20 minute sessions on at our local racetrack, Willow Springs, and I've never had any brake fade issues. Of course, that also comes along with having steel, uh, braided steel lines and upgraded racing fluid for the brakes. So we've got a car in front of us. This is a public road, so I guess I'll take this time to talk about uh, the livability of the car, driving this car day to day at normal speeds, because you're not always going to be pushing it to red line every day. Um, this car has a lot of usable power throughout the rev range. It being supercharged means you always have that power on tap. The throttle is very responsive. It's not like some other cars, some especially newer cars where you touch the throttle and it takes a bit for it to react. Your foot literally controls the engine as it should. That's why I love older cars and this car is no different. What it does is once you put your foot, you can, there's no lag. There's literally no lag between you pressing that pedal and the car applying force forward, which with a soundtrack like that, you can, can't complain with a formula like that. So the tires I'm running on are um, known as the Cheater tire. They're RE71Rs. And honestly, I've had two track days on them and about 7,000 miles of daily driving. And 
Although they're worn, they still grip like they were new. Um, I've heard that being the case with these tires. You can really run them down to the tread indicator where you should really be changing those out. So mine are on the way out, although I've rotated them. Now this car chews through the front tires really quickly, even through day-to-day -day driving. And honestly, I think that just comes along with it being a relatively higher horsepower. And I know 210 isn't that much, but pushing 210 to the front wheels, you're asking a lot from the front wheels. So what you're gonna have is a situation where your front tires are wearing out substantially quicker than your rear tires, excuse me. So what's recommended is every few I would say even every thousand miles, just rotate the tires, move the front ones to the rear, just so they get uh, equal wear throughout. But yeah, you could totally drive this car every day. It's a very comfortable ride, even with the sort sport suspension that I've put into the car. I've had some passengers complain about it being a little too bumpy, so it's definitely not like an Escalade or something, but for the compromises you make in ride quality, you definitely make up for in the handling, because man, oh man, this thing is such a balanced drive and a joy. Carving through these corners is a piece of cake. This car is basically like a front wheel drive Miata, honestly. I know Miata is always the answer, but if you want something with a little more room, and if you're tall like I am, I'm six foot three, I've got a nice amount of headroom, and this car still can accommodate tall drivers. That soundtrack never gets old. <laughs> the pops and burbles are coming through the, the audio recording because they really add to the experience. Let me talk about the history of the John Cooper Works package. It was first offered in 2004. The 2004 and 2005 option for the John Cooper Works were only installed by the dealers. You couldn't get them from the factory. I believe in 2006 was the first year where you can get this car from the factory with the John Cooper Works tuning package. Now a lot of people think that the John Cooper Works package is it's an all-encompassing thing where you get the body kit and the brakes and the tuning package for the engine and supercharger and all that But these are actually checkbox items so you can pick and choose which parts of the John Cooper Ricks Package that you wanted on your car now me being the second owner I'm not the original owner to configure this car the original owner pretty much specked out this car to have all of the luxury options and things like that but for the John Cooper Works, he only opted for the tuning package. And what that includes is the upgraded supercharger, some supporting mods, including the airbox, an ECU tune, and the John Cooper Works exhaust. There might be a few things here and there that I'm missing, but overall, the focus on that particular checkbox item was power. So this car makes 210 horsepower, and I believe 180 foot-pounds of torque, which for a car that weighs around 2,500 pounds is, I'd say more than enough. I'm really happy with the power number and I haven't messed with it. The exhaust that I've added, I don't think it really adds any power. It was just more for an audio experience and it did exactly that. You got some nice supercharger wine from the front and that beautiful exhaust in the rear. This car surprises a lot of people on the track because they don't expect a Mini to have that much power and to handle as well as it does. But with the suspension mods that I've done, paired with the John Cooper Works tuning package, uh, it, really, it really makes for a successful formula. I've passed SS Camaros, I've passed Z06 Corvettes at our local racetrack, Willow Springs, Streets of Willow I'm talking about. Uh, it's the smaller, more technical course where this car would naturally shine. Obviously, if those cars had more competent drivers behind the wheel, they would probably be passing me all day, but with the way this car is set up, you'll be passing a lot of more capable cars on the track. So I've got Ireland Engineering fixed camber plates on the front, paired with Hotchkiss Sport rear control arms, a beefier rear sway bar from Hotchkiss Sport, and that overall suspension paired with the Coney Sport Yellows and the Swift Spec R Springs gives a very neutral handling experience. It doesn't understeer at all, you never feel any understeer. The only complaints I could probably have with the handling of this car has probably more to do with um, the configuration of the driveline, it being a front wheel drive car and inherently it's going to have some torque steer. But 
honestly, it's not that bad. <laughs> Those guys were filming their M3s and broke their necks. Yeah, with the exhaust on this car, it attracts quite a bit of attention, especially when you hear that supercharger whine. It's a lot more pronounced outside. And it'll break some necks because people will be like, what is that? What is that? And they see a mini roaring by and they're like, what? It's totally unexpected. So we're at a little turnout here. And I'm gonna pull over to do some nice B-roll shots. Now that we've gotten to the rest area at the top of Angeles Crest, I guess it's time to go over some of the things that I've had to experience owning this car for about two years. So the first thing that pretty much went on this car was the glove box. Now this handle is a really common thing. Something to look out for if you're looking to buy one, just check out the handle if it opens. They tend to go bad pretty often, so I've replaced my entire glove box since that's something that can't be replaced individually as a small part. Another weird thing that's gone off on my car is this little cover right here got loose. Uh, I had to fix the tabs on the inside and I reattached it with some of that uh, special adhesive that they use for body parts like this. So that's on there tight now. Moving up, I replaced the Willwood brakes like I said earlier. This is an 11.75 inch rotor. This is the Willwood um, I believe TCE was the guy that I bought it from. He sets up this entire kit. The reason why I went with this kit instead of the larger kit with the bigger rotors and potentially bigger caliper as well, uh, although those would break and dissipate heat better, uh, I was looking to potentially run 15 inch wheels. These are 17 inch BBS wheels that I have on here right now. And it was just for um, giving me the option in the future if I ever wanted to replace them. Another thing if you're new to minis is the smell. And at first I thought something was wrong with my car. I took it to a mini specialist that's in my area and uh, it smelled kind of like oil. I thought my car was burning through oil, but whenever I checked the oil levels, everything was okay. So I was just concerned with the smell, especially on startup. On startup, it's, it's just oil. It smells like oil. I took it to uh, my mechanic and he told me that this is this is what mini smell like so if that's something that you're concerned about and you're looking at a mini uh, don't don't look too deep into it there might be something wrong with that particular car don't get me wrong but with my particular car the smell apparently is normal according to that specialist and he's been working on racing tracking and doing all the stuff with minis so if he says it's a normal smell then i'm gonna go with it. one area that people don't expect the mini to excel at is storage space and although if you have the rear seats up, you're not really dealing with much uh, space, but if you put the rear seats down, you're gonna have a ton of storage. I've used this, believe it or not, to transport a queen size mattress, um, engines, car engines in the back here, obviously with coverings so I don't damage anything. But it's a very capable car. If you, if you need something for uh, two people, driver and a passenger, um, you can fit a ton of stuff. Now onto the build quality. Now these cars were built by BMW, so you ex you kind of expect it to be in the premium luxury segment in terms of materials used. And honestly, the materials they used were all really nice. The doors feel extremely heavy. I call this car the little tank, or sometimes the flying brick, just because aerodynamically it's kind of challenged. <laughs> now, when it comes to the material choices on this car, I have zero complaints. Everything feels quality and heavy. What I kind of liken it to is like a bodybuilder. He's got like big muscles and everything, but he has weak joints. So this car is like a bodybuilder with weak joints. It's got all the right materials. Everything feels really tight and heavy. All the materials used are of quality. Um, where they could have used metal, they did, uh, except for that little clip for the glove box. But yeah, that's another story but everything feels good. 
it's just, it's not held together well. It's like the adhesives they used or the joints that were made were made of cheap materials for whatever reason. It's like if you're gonna cut costs, don't cut it where materials are being combined together because then they'll break apart. And the main issues I've had with this car haven't really been mechanical, thankfully, and that might be due to it being a lower mile car. I have about 55 or 56,000 miles, but uh, the main issues have been with things breaking off or falling off. Things that are attached, like the headliner, for example, it's, it's a really thin cloth material attached to a foam backing, and that thin part just droops down, and it's a very common issue. I fixed it on my car. Have a video on it that I can link somewhere over wherever but it's that same theme carries on throughout the entire car it's like they glued it together with you know that glue you'd use in elementary school or grade school where you'd connect two pieces of paper paper together or maybe take some pieces of macaroni dry like dried macaroni and stick it to the paper anyway I'm going off on a tangent my point is it's not held together well the doors slam really well, they feel heavy, all the materials feel heavy, the shifter feels fantastic, but the little finishing touches were kind of an afterthought. You know, the, the way they attached it, I've heard these cars are known for rattling a lot, and although this is a facelift model, which means the 2005 and 2006 models were known as the facelift models, where they redid some of the interior, they they upgraded some things with the, uh, the engine, they offered a limited slip differential, uh, they had a lot of different things changed both uh, cosmetically and mechanically um, that got rid of a lot of the rattles and and little uh, little issues that the older models had but they they weren't um, you know immune to some of these small issues that I've that I've already experienced myself it's not a bad car by any means but it's just something to look out for it's small things that you really end up fixing more often than you would in a normal car let's say like a Camry or something so let's get back on the road Cars on and let's go for a drive. That supercharger wine never gets old. Cool thing about minis is that they're totally daily drivable, especially if you live in the city. Uh, it's a very simple car to park with it being so small. But with the size also comes a few drawbacks. For example, uh, suspension travel is, is very short on this car. And what that means is when you go over a bump that might upset, uh, that might not upset other cars, will really upset the handling of this car. It'll bounce around a lot more just because of the short wheelbase. So pretty much any road imperfections while driving at speed, say on the highway or something, uh, will really upset the car's balance and get the car hopping around a bit. So ideally, there'd be smooth roads everywhere, but that's not really the case. If you don't live next to any nice, smooth roads, then this car might get annoying every day. So after owning the car for two years, would I recommend it? I think that really depends on who you are. If you're somebody that likes to work on their cars a lot, tinker with things and fix things when they break, because they will break with this car, it's not a matter of if, it's when, then yeah, this, this car is a very fun car to own. It's full of character. You can have a ton of fun. Every time I get in it and I go for a drive, I have a huge smile on my face. Uh, it's a very lively car. It's not something that you get into and while you're driving you get bored. It's not one of those cars, you know? But with that comes the other side of the equation where this might not be a type of experience that you want every time you get into a car. The fuel economy, um, honestly, for how I drive, it's not that bad. I average around 20 miles to the gallon in normal city driving. And if I'm feeling feather footed on the highway, I can really get around 30 to 33 miles per gallon on the highway. So that's not bad at all considering what this car is. But yeah, if you work on your own cars, uh, this, this is gonna be a lot more enjoyable of an experience. If you're somebody that takes their cars to the mechanic for every single issue, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, uh, if you're gonna be doing that with this car, it can get expensive really quickly because not only are the parts expensive with BMW making all the parts, um, working on this car isn't necessarily easy. So a few things that BMW Mini did with the design of this car is in order to maintain the cute looks and the small proportions, they kind of crammed everything that you would have in a normal car into a much tighter space. 
So what that means is anytime you have to work on something in the engine bay, uh, you come out looking like you had an aggressive handshake with Edward Scissorhands. It's a really tight space to work and it's not fun, especially doing normal maintenance things like changing the oil, an oil filter. I can't express how much I hate the oil filter placement location. It's all the way in the back of the motor. Yeah, it's a really big pain working on this car. All right, well that's gonna be it for today's video. Thank you guys for watching. Please leave a like, don't forget to subscribe. And if you guys have any suggestions or comments on the audio quality, video quality, um, the format of the video, my presentation, all of that stuff, please leave them down in the comments below and let me know what you guys think of the video. Uh, I wanna do more of these if I can in the future and any suggestions and comments would really help the growth of the channel. It's a small channel and I wanna kind of uh, make it a little more healthy, <laughs> so to speak. So yeah, thank you guys for watching and take care.